All right, let's uh, turn in your hymnals now, if you would, please, with me to number 212. Together for our final hymn together of the morning worship service. And I think the title is certainly appropriate. We do live in very interesting times, don't we? I think we can all agree to that. I've seen some in my lifetime, many, many changing things different things in the times that we live in. The signs of the times are pretty evident, I think. Well, let's sing about end times like these together. So who was it that uh, selected that song? Was that Kurt or was that Sandy that selected that? Brother Kurt? <laughs> I'm just trying to see who the one was that selected that song in times like these. So, Brother Kurt, was it... Uh, was it you that selected the, this song in times like these, or was this uh, Sandy? <laughs> okay. uh, don't know 
for sure. Well, I just think that it really, it really links in fairly close with the message. I mean, we, last week we talked about apostasy, and this week we're going to look at apostasy again a little, a little bit more. And in times like these, it's kind of the condition and where we're at, and it, it speaks truth. But I don't want to, I, I really like it how we have it, that I don't select the songs out. A lot of pastors want to handpick and select the songs that they have played in the, in the service. And I don't do that, and part of the reason why I don't want to do that is I want the Holy Spirit to work in each one of our hearts. And it's amazing to see how He does that as we come together, that I don't have to orchestrate everything because our Comforter has come. And our Comforter will be the one that organizes it and leads it and directs it, and that's oftentimes what I see Him doing exactly. So praise the Lord for in times like these, because it goes hand in hand with uh, what we're going to continue to look at uh, this morning. And if you do, if you take God's Word and you open up again to the blessed book of Jude, I always want to say Jude chapter 1. It really, I guess, is Jude chapter 1, but there's not chapter 2. So Jude, if you open up with me this morning. We had looked at last week and learned, I think probably many of us already knew, that uh, Jude was the Lord Jesus Christ's half-brother, also a full brother to James, and he came to faith as an adult, and uh, he did live with the Lord Jesus Christ all those early years growing up, but he never came to trust and believe that he was a Christ at that time, and can you imagine that? Jude, growing up with the Lord, who we have to say never sinned in the home. From the time that he was a little baby, being maybe a demand-fed baby, we see that kind of with our little granddaughter, that, that demand-fed, where they, they want things. on their, The Lord Jesus Christ never was like that because he was perfect from the womb. That he would have never sinned, even in those early years, like every one of us. Have done So can you imagine Jude growing up with him and seeing him never do anything wrong or amiss? It might even kind of cause a little conflict in your heart. Well, look at this fella, you know, he's, he doesn't do anything wrong ever. What is it? What's different about him? But never in those early years did he come to believe that he was a savior. He didn't tell later on when he became an adult. He believed in the savior. Jude, as we looked at last week, was going on his own pathway and going to write about the common salvation. But the Holy Spirit, right, because a comforter has come, directed him into a different area. You're not going to write on the common salvation, Jude, but you're going to write on apostasy, the times in which we're in. You're going to write on the apostasy. And we looked at apostasy as a departure from the faith. It's that false believer or a false professor that has come in amongst us, said that they're a believer, come and partake and taste of all that God has to offer, that even being the Holy Spirit being present with us and leading us, but comes to that point in their life, where they walk away and they reject it. It isn't a matter that they've lost their salvation. It's that they haven't truly, like we looked at last week, answered the call. The call of salvation in their life. And as Jude begins to explain apostasy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his life, I think he kind of looks at it in his time as a small cloud. And as we look at it in our day, that small cloud of apostasy has turned into a darker cloud. And yet it's going to turn into a darker cloud I, where there's thunders and there's lightning and there's terribleness to come. We know that we are in the days of apostasy. That apostasy amongst us, apostate church. And as we get closer to the Lord's return to come and take the church out, that apostasy is going to get thicker and thicker and thicker and darker 
and darker. But we looked at last week that amongst the darkness of the apostasy, those of us that have truly been called, God tells us that you have been preserved. We will be preserved through the apostasy, the apostate church. So here, Jude begins to write about apostasy. But we're going to see here, as we're preserved in this time, and we learn that the apostasy is about us, how are we to act in the apostasy? That's what I want to look at this morning. Is how are we to conduct ourselves during this time in which we are in? And I, t I titled this message this morning, Earnestly Contend for the Faith earnestly contend for the faith. You see, I want to read just a little portion of verse 3, about the middle, it says, Jude says, it, it was needful for me to write unto you. It was needful. He was under great compulsion to write of this time that was coming upon the church, not only so they understood what was happening, but they would understand how they could go through it and how they needed to act amongst it. So it was needful for him to write. And I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit inspired this to him because it was needful for me to hear this message, to understand and see what God has here for us so that we can endure and that we can go through this together, how God has showed us. So I'm going to begin reading... Uh, in verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 4, but our focus is really going to be on verse 3. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, two things we looked at last week, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now notice, I want, I want you to notice there when he, mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Those that have truly been called. Because we're going to experience that in these days of apostasy. Beloved, when I gave all diligent to write unto you of the, of the common salvation. That's what he wanted to write about. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you, you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our, Lord, of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Earnestly contending for the faith. It's needful, needful for him to write this. Needful for us to know this in our lives. And I'm going to give us some words that we're going to break down and look at. And the first word is going to be exhort. He says, it is needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you. There's probably somebody in this room that understands our exhortation more than anybody else. And that would be those that have the gift. And I know Shannon has the gift of exhortation. The gift of encouraging. But there's kind of two sides of encouragement. But she is an encourager. I wish I had the gift of encouragement like, like Shannon does. Because I'm not an encourager. I have to look at things and try and encourage. And it's hard. It is hard to do. Those of you that don't have that gift know what I'm talking about. It's hard. You've got to force yourself. You've got to make it happen. And it's tough. But exhort here means the side of encouragement to admonish. It means to admonish you, to reprove mildly, not a hard reproof, but a mild reproof to correct a fault. So he exhorts them, I'm exhorting you, it's needful for me to write to you and to exhort you. That means they were doing something wrong. Remember that little cloud, that little cloud of apostasy at their time was small compared to our day. In our time. So there's a need for us to be exhorted or to be admonished. Because what are we doing in the time of apostasy right now? With the apostasy within the church. The apostate church. You see what they were doing. 
is they were just sitting tight. They weren't doing anything. They weren't alarmed by it. They didn't have an understanding of it. They didn't say anything about it. You see, it's time for us. When he's exhorting here, it's time for us to stand up in the apostasy. It's time for us to stand up. That's what he's saying. Isn't that what you do, Shannon, when you encourage? Don't you want people to stand up and do what you should be doing? That's what she's wanting them to do. Yes. Stand up. Go the right direction. This is where you need to go. I'm pushing you out there. Well, the same things for us. Stand up, brothers and sisters, in the apostasy, because we're in it. And it's happening all around us. Look at the churches all around and how they've deviated from the holy written word. Of God. And they've watered down the message. Look at what's going on around us. Now he goes on after the exhortation and he uses the word I exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for. Earnestly contend for. Which this earnest word here is not the earnestness of the Holy Spirit. Or the earnest of the Holy Spirit, which is that down payment. But earnestly here is warmly having the warm zealousness and a strong desire. Warmly zealous with a strong desire. And I think warm, I think warm here gives the key to it. Because you, you see, we can be zealous and we can have a strong desire. But if we don't have warmth behind it, it comes off the wrong way doesn't it? I'm thinking of warmth. It might be maybe even the warming of love, right? The warmth, zealous in a real desire. Basically, he's saying, quit sitting around. It's time. Now's the time for you and I to truly contend for the faith. He exhorts them to have this warm zeal and a real desire to stand up in these times. Have you been? Who, who's actually, who, who could pinpoint an apostate church? Could anybody? I could, I could pinpoint an apostate church. Okay. Maybe an apostate, somebody that's a professing believer that you have your questions about based on their life. I know Brother Lee shared a story on Thursday, so I know he's got one person's name in his mind that he's thinking of right now. You think of that apostasy, the apostate people that are around us. Are we just allowing them to be that way? Or are we standing up for what is right? They weren't standing up. They were just sitting down. So now when we stand up and we got this warm zeal and this desire, how do we use it? How do we use it? That's the contend for part. The contend for part tells us how we're supposed to use it then. And contend, I'm going to finish that part. It says here, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Contend here means to struggle for the faith. A struggle for the faith. But in the struggle... For the faith in, in, in our struggle for the apostate church and to, to stand on what is right and what is true, there's a war that we're fighting. There's a, there's, we're fighting this back and forth. And how do I do it? How do I go forward in this for the Lord? And how is my attitude supposed to be? How's the attitude of my heart to be? Well, contend means this to fight. For without being contentious. To fight for without being contentious about it. I'll give you an example. You all know I'm King James Bible. Okay? I think the King James Bible is the most accurate. Okay? Now I've I've talked about it quite a bit lately that I don't normally talk about it quite as much. But I'll give you an example with this. I, if somebody else isn't quite there with the King James Bible, now I can be contentious and I can push them further away because I believe it's 
the right way to go. But it's all in my manner and my delivery in trying to convince others that it's better. Right? Now, I've been under teaching before with the King James Bible where it was contentious. It came with the wrong spirit behind it. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? So that's it. You, I'm just giving you one example. There's a whole bunch of examples that we could give. You see that? How we could be contentious about it. Or we can have the warmth that God wants us to have behind it. So that's the first thing we have to consider in this apostasy that we have going on out here. Is we need to fight for what is right and what is true, but not be contentious in it. And then secondly, we must not strive. That means to fight. Strive means fight or dispute. But we must be gentle. And I want to take us to a, another scripture that talks about that right there that I just described to you from 2 Timothy Chapter 2 and verse 24 and following down, I'm going to read. So 2 Timothy 2, 24. So we must not strive, that means to fight or dispute, but we must be gentle. Verse 24 says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Every one of you are servants of the Lord. I'm a servant of the Lord. You're a servant of the Lord. We're all just in different places in our lives, aren't we? And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. He must be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Isn't that what the apostates are doing? They're opposing themselves. They're opposing the church. They're opposing the right direction. Those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. And all of it can be in how we handle ourselves. It can be. How we, remember this, the passages that talk about a husband and wife that are married. But one of those within the home got saved, but the other one is an unbeliever. And a key to the husband, it could be the husband or the wife, but a key to maybe a husband's salvation could be in how the wife reacts, how she acts and how she conducts herself, that he would see Christ in her. That might be the thing. Kind of the same thing here. And they, and that they may recover, verse 26, themselves out of the snare of the devil, who were taken captive by him at his will. Who's behind the apostate church? Who is behind the apostate church? It's Satan. It's the devil, isn't it? That's what he's wanting to do to cause the cloud. He wants these people to fall away. So we need to fight for without being contentious. And in that we need to be gentle. The warmness. The warmness. And then the word... Contend here also has another part of it. Not only that fighting part and that struggling part, but it has a side that means great agony. Great agony. As we go through this apostasy, there's great agony that comes upon our spirit and our heart. Lee, did you too have great agony the other, the other night? In the situation... The, wasn't there, there was agony that you had in your heart, wasn't there? I mean, there was, it was ag, you were agonizing over the old nature and the new nature too, right? A little bit. How, how do we react to this particular thing? They know what's going on. I won't share that unless they do on their, on their own, those events. But it really, I, when Lee was sharing that story with me, I was going to say, you need to come up here and preach on Sunday because that's really kind of what it's talking about, what you're going through in your lives. But this agony, this, this contending for means that we're going to agonize. Suffer distress because of this apostasy. It might be what, what people are saying about the Word of God or how they're changing the Word of God. How they're taking doctrine, truth, and, and they're convoluting it with error. 
We're agonizing over these things that are going on. I'm agonizing over a church in Cody that's turned, I think, apostate. I'm agonizing. There's other people that are agonizing over what's taken place there. The church was founded on the Word of God. It was founded on the truth, biblical truth. The rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, and where it's gone. Oh, it's, it's agonizing. But the key is, is how do we react out of the agony? We have to react right out of the agony. See, it's very easy. It's very easy when we're agonizing to react wrong, isn't it? Where we don't have the warmth. We don't have that zeal and that strong desire like God wants us to, to not be contentious, but be gentle and meek like the Lord wants us to do. Who's failed in that? I raise my hand because I failed. Yeah, I have. That's why it's so important. He tells us. He tells, this is how you need to do it. I'm showing you how we need to approach this. And then he goes on. If you go back to Jude. The last part. He says, we looked at the exhortation to earnestly contend for. And then. He says, for what? It's the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It hasn't changed. It stayed the same. God's word never changes. It's always consistent. It's always been the same. So why do we need to reinvent it? We don't. We don't need to. I, I just got another thought I have to share with, with, with some of these other things here that we're, we're talking about in uh, reacting right. I want you to think of salt. We've heard of those scriptures that talk about salt. We're to be, we're to salt the earth. I had problems with that for a long time trying to think out. Lord, what are you trying to tell me with being the salt? We're to be the, we're to be the salt. Well, that's kind of the key to this apostasy, I think. The salt... There was a lot of those people that he's talking about. Don't let your salt lose its flavor, right? Because salt that doesn't have any flavor is bad, isn't it? So to have good salt, as we're thinking about apostasy, is how we react that we're not contentious, we're gentle, we're warm. When we're agonized, we react, right? But you know what we do with that salt then? That salt is God's word. I spread it over there, don't I? Amongst apostasy. I'm, sp I'm spreading the salt, God's word, the truth that we're standing on to the world, right? And what does it do when it goes out there? It doesn't return void if it's truth. It's salting. Something's happening when God's word's going out there. But we sit amongst the apostasy and we don't stand up. And we don't use the right heart. And finally, when we do stand up, it's with the wrong spirit, isn't it? It's with the wrong spirit, and it's not pleasing to the Lord. Well, here's this. What is this faith then? This faith is that whole body of truth that God has given us. Old Testament, New Testament, the whole Bible, 66 books of the Bible. The faith once delivered it hasn't changed. Stand for it, right? This whole body of truth. In Acts 2.43, right after the church began, there's a whole bunch of things that are told to us that we're to keep. One of those is stay steadfast or steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, that almost sounds like the apostles had their own doctrine, but they didn't. That's the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus Christ. Did Jesus teach in the Old Testament? I say that he does because he's the Word, isn't he? He's the Word of God. He taught in the Old Testament. We even see the pre-incarnate appearances of Christ. He's God. Who was it in the burning bush? Who was it? I believe that's the Lord Jesus Christ that Moses saw right there in the burning bush. The Lord Jesus Christ has been teaching from the days of creation all the way till now. The whole body of the truth. But we live in a particular day like no other. 
we have the fullness of God's word before us. Right? Even in the days that it was being penned, right here when Jude was penning it, he didn't have it in its entirety. He had the Old Testament, but not the entirety of the New Testament like we have. Oh, we should much more contend for the faith. We should, because we have the whole body of truth, you and I do. So, I've just given a few examples of this truth and doctrine. And we are in the days and the time where people are saying, you don't need to hold the doctrine. Let's let doctrine, I've said this before, let's let doctrine go by the wayside and let's just love one another. Let's do a great big group, group hug. Come on. Let's just love each other and let's put aside doctrine. Lee likes group hugs. I used to run from here at the police department. He's one of those huggers. I was like running. I don't hug like that. Hug my wife like that, but that's the only person. <laughs> but here, the whole body of truth here, all the doctrine. So that means when we talk about angels, like what we're studying right now in Sunday school class, you could go out on the street right now and you could go talk to somebody. I want you to give me an understanding of God's creation of the angels. Can you do that? You know what they'll say? I don't even know when they were created for sure. I, you know, I, I don't know if there's guardian angels. I don't know if there's... You know some of the questions that we had? You're going to see the same thing out there. Does the Lord Jesus Christ want us to understand angels that he created? Yes, he does. Doesn't he? We don't put it aside. Satan. God wants us to understand who he is. And there's doctrine. There's a doctrine of Satan. Lee said here recently, didn't he? His picture of Satan was in a red suit with horns, a pitchfork, and a tail. And that's an improper illustration of what Satan is, right? And, and he's the ruler of hell. Isn't that what Lee said? No, that isn't right. That's not true. That's false. If you've been looking at that, you've been led away by an apostate. Because that's not true. That's an error. Sin, the doctrine of sin. Salvation. Oh, we got a beautiful picture on Thursday of salvation. Oh, God gave us a new little clip. I loved it. I loved it. I appreciated it. We were looking at the five-fold judgment that happened to Adam and Eve after they sinned. The judgment comes upon the man. It comes upon the woman. It comes upon nature. It comes upon the serpent. And it comes upon Satan. Now, as we looked at it, the actual curse, the actual curse of that is on the nature, it's on the serpent, and it's on Satan. But you never see the curse upon man. Does that give us a key to salvation? It does, because there's a false doctrine out there that talks about salvation. If God picked out a handful of people to damnation, then he cursed them then. He didn't curse man, because his desire for man from that time was to save man. And to save woman. And allow me. And it's a particular point you have to see. The curse wasn't on man. You know, people at the Bible study, when we were talking about it, they said, I always thought the curse was on man. There's no curse on man. There is, there is going to be if man rejects the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Then they'll face the judgment of hell. But right now in our day and our hour, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling like we looked at last week, isn't he? Oh, man. But if we don't understand the doctrine of salvation, an apostate could lead us astray and lead us somewhere that's not true. It's not right. The Holy Spirit that we were just singing about. Oh, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. Oh, that gives great joy to my heart that it's he that lives in me. And then I can give him the power in my life and not my own nature. Oh, you experienced it, didn't you? I know that you guys, in that situation that you talked about that Lee shared, the Holy Spirit intervened and gave you the reaction that he wanted you to have. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you would have done the wrong thing. You would have. The Holy Spirit. But understanding the Spirit of God, the true doctrine of the Holy Spirit, because apostate could lead you astray. In the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we could be led out in a field in an area that's off and it's wrong. We are to stand. 
in the days of apostasy. Not only that, prophecy. Oh, prophecy, Bible prophecy. I've said this a million times. I have. The pan theory says it doesn't matter about prophecy. It doesn't matter how things are going to end. It does matter. And Jesus is excited about it. And he's taught us about it. And he wants us to know about it from the beginning of Genesis to Revelation. He is taught about it. And how you look at prophecy, I've told us this before. In Genesis, it's going to make a difference how you interpret Genesis. And it's going to make a difference in how you interpret Revelation. Prophecy in God's word, we need to understand it. Because it makes a difference. And in order for us to stand, we've got to understand all these doctrines. We can't put it aside. We can't put it aside and group hug. It doesn't work. It does not work. It doesn't. We've got to stand. Oh, you think of the resurrection. How many people know about death? The afterlife. They don't. I'll, I'll tackle it when it comes. Right? Do you know what happens at the resurrection? Do you know when you're going to be resurrected? In the church, we understand and we know it's at the rapture of the church. We get a new body that we looked at a little bit this morning. We know that it'll never grow old. It'll be young. But now if you're an Old Testament saint, when's the Old Testament saint resurrected? It's not at the same time. How about the tribulation saints? How about this one? When are the millennial saints resurrected? You ever thought of that one? We need to know. So we can give answers to the people. And we can stand for the truth when they're around us speaking air. We're the ones to shed and sprinkle the salt out there in the world, aren't we? We're not just to sit tight, but we're to stand. We're to stand on the truth. Now, I'm going to end with, with this thought. What Ephesians 4.15 says, because I think it gives us another key picture of this. I've been studying Ephesians on my own. Ephesians 4. I'll start in verse 14. Uh, how about 13? Till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, Whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's the apostate. Lying in wait to get a hold of you and draw you out of what the truth is. But notice what he goes on. He goes on and he says, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. May grow up into him in all things, which this is the head, even Christ. We got to stand up in the days of apostasy. We do. But he tells us to speak the truth, salt, with the love of the Lord. As we do that. And that's hard. Because this love is speaking about the agape love. The unconditional love that Christ has for us. That means when we look out at the apostate, we hate his sin. We hate his sin. We hate what he's doing. But we love him. And we want to do what we can to bring him to the truth of God's word. So in apostasy, I think Jude has opened up a little picture for us. That we need to be exhorted. <clears throat> that means we be, need to be admonished to stand. And while we stand... I want you to be thinking of warmly, warm, zealous, strong desire for God, His word and His direction. We contend, but we don't be contentious. And we have to be gentle. And in our agony, we have to react right. And then, and then finally, 
We have to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. I don't know about you, but I'm failing. <laughs> I, I think I'm getting an F. And the Lord is using this. He's using Jude for me. Like I said before, I don't know if it's for all of you, but it's for me. Right here and right now. These words that he's showing me, that's how I need to be. That's what I need to do. God help us. To help us to do what you want us to do. And not what I want to do. That's what Brother Kurt said about parenting, didn't he? Oftentimes we want to parent how we want to parent. But God has a way. And that's what he wants us to do. God has a way of us to deal with apostasy. And he's shown it to us. And that's what he wants us to do. Let's pray. And after we pray, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have Caleb just uh, turn off the camera and stuff. And I really kind of put Lee on the spot, but I'd like for him to kind of end and share his story if he doesn't mind for this week. Would you mind doing that? No? Okay. Okay. We won't, hopefully maybe he'll have opportunity at another time to be able to share uh, some of his thoughts and stuff. I thought it went real, real well with the things that were going on. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your direction in our lives. Lord, as a, apostasy is going on, there's apostates, Father, that could be amongst us. There's the apostate church. Lord, help us to come to the realization that it's true. And they're trying to lead us astray, trying to lead us in a direction, Lord, that's outside your will, outside your direction. And Father, help us to stand. Help us to be exhorted to stand, Lord, because we've been sitting. We've been allowing it to take place on our sides. But as we stand, Lord, you've given us the keys to standing. Lord, you've given us the, the keys to the attitude of our heart in this, Lord. Because just like a, a, a man or a woman that's unsaved in a home and the, other, and the other spouse shows them Christ, there's an opportunity for them to come. And there's an opportunity even for the apostate, Lord, possibly as we stand right here, that they could turn from the air of their way. Lord, because I know that you're a long-suffering God. And your desire is that none should perish but that all should come to repentance and believe upon you. Father, we just ask that you'd be with us in the remainder of this day. Lord, and as we go to look at this uh, building too, Lord, give us wisdom as we come back here tonight for our uh, meeting together, Lord. We just ask that you be in every step, every thought, Lord. Guide us and lead us. In the name of Jesus, amen.